So hello everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, it's a great pleasure to give a presentation today. Uh, as introduced uh, by uh, Brock, I'm Jingguo Liu from Sansing University of Science and Technology, China. Uh, thank Brock and Carol for giving me this opportunity to give a talk at the IUCN's Ecological Restoration uh, webinar. So my talk is about ecological restoration in China. Well, as I introduced, I'm from Sansing University of Science and Technology. I want to first show a few slides uh, for my university's campus. This is the campus of our university. So here you see very nice uh, sky, very beautiful clouds. So I also want to show you a few pictures I took my own. So for this picture I, I took in the campus, you can see, well, you can see in our campus we have a lot of grassland, here is a river, so we also have a well to monitor the groundwater level. So in the campus, you can always see the blue sky, the white clouds. So in a year, most of the time, you can see blue sky and the clouds. But sometimes, so this one I took, this picture I took yesterday. And then the next slide, the next picture, I took the, uh, the day before yesterday. So you can see very beautiful sky in the campus. And I took this picture in June. So this is our faculty apartment in the campus. I also live in the faculty apartment. So I took this picture from, uh, from my apartment. You can see very beautiful sky. And also uh, we have nine, month, uh, nine uh, small hills in the campus. So each year in summer, you can find a lot of uh, leeches. And uh, in June, it's the harvest time for lychee. So if you visit our campus in June, you can enjoy the lychee a lot. It's a very nice fruit. So for our university, it's a very young university. Uh, SUSTEC, the Sansing uh, University of Science and Technology, is a university of 10 years old. So this year, at the end of this year, we will celebrate the a 10 year anniversary of our university. But we are very proud because we have achieved a lot uh, based on the world rankings. We are the first in the world among the young universities created from scratch. We are also the first in mainland China for citations. So that means our papers uh, have been cited a lot among all the universities in China. So for the Nature Index, our university is ranked as the, the seventh, sorry, the seventh in the world among all the universities under 50. And uh, the university is ranked as the eighth in the world for international collaboration and the first in mainland China for quality of research and also the first in mainland China for faculty student ratio. So if you are interested in our university, you can contact me. You are always welcome to visit us. So for today's presentation, I would like to talk about five issues. First, I would like to introduce the three development periods in China. And then I will talk about the ecological restoration programs. And then the effects of ecological restoration Afterward, I want to mention the issues and the challenges we are facing. And at the end, I would like to give some concluding remarks. So first of all, I would like to acknowledge my thanks to my colleague, uh, Dr. Wenhui Cui. She is a postdoc in my team. She helped me to prepare some slides for this presentation. I also want to give my special thanks to the National Natural Science Foundation of China to support my research. 
So now I would like to move to the three development periods in China. So uh, this is based on my research. I class, uh, classify uh, different periods uh, for China's development. The first period, I called it the economic priorities period. So that is before 2000, year 2000. During this period, the main objective is to increase GDP. So uh, like uh, uh, between 1978 and 2000, uh, China increased the GDP and uh, most of the time at the cost of the declining natural capital. And then at the end of the uh, 20th century, we had a lot of disasters. The government and the Chinese people realized that if we only develop our GDP without taking care of the uh, ecosystems, we may have a lot of problems. So between 2000 and 2012, this is the transitional period. And the government and the public started to think about the nature, the harmony between people and nature. And after 2002, we paid more and more attention to the ecology, uh, to the uh, ecology. So this is the third period, we call it the ecological priorities period. So for the first period, the main issue is GDP. So the Chinese people were climbing up to the gold and the silver mountains, try to get a higher GDP. And then the third development period, we take more about the green mountains and the clean water. So this is the third period. So now I would like to, to talk about uh, a little bit about the GDP development. So this is the GDP uh, between 1978. This is the time for China, uh, China's uh, reform and open up to the international market. So from 1978 to 2012, you can see a sharp increase in GDP. And this is the year 2000. This, uh, before 2000, this is the economic priorities period. And between 2000 and 2012, that is the transitional period for development. So our university is located in Shenzhen and uh, Shenzhen has experience, uh, experienced a sharp change. So this picture show uh, Shenzhen uh, in early 1980s. So you can see a lot of uh, natural landscape uh, with a lot of rural areas. And then this is the picture in 2010. So if we compare the two pictures, we will found a sharp change. And this is the picture in 19, uh, 1980s. And then the lower picture show uh, the, uh, the picture in 2010. So if we compare the GDP and the population, in 1980, the total population in Shenzhen was 330,000. But in 2012, the population was more than 10 million. This means the population is more than 30 times higher than the population in the 1980s. If we compare the GDP, the change is even sharper the GDP in 1980s, that was 0 0.27 billion yuan, but the GDP in 2012, uh, GDP was about, uh, about 1,300 billion yuan. So the GDP in 2012 was more than 5,000 times higher than that in 1980s. And from 2012 to 2009, population further increased to 13 million people, and the GDP doubled between 2012 and 2019. So the current GDP is 
even more than 10,000 times of the GDP just 40 years ago. So you can see the big change for the Shenzhen city. The Shenzhen city used to be a very small village, but now it became a mega city. So we have a big change in landscape. And for the first period before 2000, as I introduced, the main issue is to increase GDP. But this is, this is mainly at the cause of the ecological degradation. So I want to show a few examples. The first example is located in the northeastern part of China. So that is the Sanjiang plan in the northeastern part of China. For this reason, there were a lot of marshland. So there are a lot of marshes in this region. So in the map, the marshes are marked in green. So we can find a lot of green areas. That means the, the marsh area was very big. The total area was about 5 million hectare. But in 2000, so this is the total area in 1950s, and the total marsh area in 2000 was about 1.35 million hectare. So if we compare both the maps, we found that there were only small areas of marshes in this area. So we have a lot of wetland losses in the northeastern part of China. And another, another case is the Yellow River. So Yellow River is the, the mother river of China, one mother river of China. And then uh, before 2000, we can see the sharp decrease in the river runoff. Uh, this this uh, graph shows the runoff change between 1970 and 2000. We can see that the runoff decreased very sharply. And particularly, uh, the river ran dry before it reached the, the sea. So in the year of 1997, the Yellow River ran dry for 226 days. This was a disaster for, for the Mother River, the Yellow River. So we also have a lot of problems for another mother river called the Yangtze River. The main problem is the forest losses in the Yangtze River. Uh, between 1950s and 1980s, the forest coverage in the Sichuan province that is located here. So uh, uh, the, the forest the coverage decreased from 20% to 12%. It was reduced from 1.3 million hectare to 0.4 million hectare in the catchments of River Mi and River Chaling. Uh, both of them are big uh, reaches, the big branches of the Yellow River. So we can find uh, forest losses in the Yellow River basin uh, during uh, the first development period. And we have a lot of other examples of ecological degradation, uh, like the Dongqing Lake. Dongqing Lake is also in the Yangtze River, and it used to be the largest freshwater lake in China. But we can see the shrinkage of the Dongqing Lake uh, in, the, in, in, in history. And here, those maps show the declining area of the uh, lake area. So the, the, blue, uh, the blue color show the uh, Dongting Lake wetland area from 1979 to 1998. So we can see the sharp decrease in the lake area during this period. And not only for the Dongting Lake, but for almost all the lakes in the a Yangtze River Basin, we can see decrease in the lake area. Those, 
Those are the six major lakes in the Yangtze River Basin. And uh, for, for all of them, their area decreased sharply during the first development period. And uh, this is a paper we published very recently. Uh, the paper was accepted this week. So we show the change in the lake area in the Yangtze River Basin. And uh, uh, here, we, uh, here uh, this map shows the, the, uh, the lake area. And uh, we, we can find decrease in the lake area. And the main reason for the declining lake area is because of the uh, more uh, area for the aquaculture zone and also for agriculture and built up land. So the lake area was converted into the aquaculture zone and agricultural or built up land. So this kind of conversion makes the uh, lake area uh, decreased in the history. So because of the big change in ecosystem services, uh, China had a lot of ecological problems uh, uh, in 1997 and 1998. So in 1998, China suffered the worst floods in over 44 years. The Yellow River and its tributaries were battered by over 60 days of heavy uh, flooding. So you can see a lot of pictures here and the Chinese people were fighting against the, the 1998 floods. And this flood gave a lot of problems. And uh, about 223 million people were affected. More than 3,000 people died. And more than 15 million people were homeless during the flood, uh, flood uh, event. So the, uh, the water shortage in 1997 and the major floods in 1998 and a, a series of sand and dust storms in 1999 and 2000 aroused the social and the political concerns about forest and uh, ecological conservation in China. And the state council issued two very important policies one was released in 1998, that was called the National Plan of Ecological Environment Construction. And the second was released in the year 2000, that was called the uh, Compendium of National Environment Conservation. So this uh, compendium uh, found uh, uh, reported that the natural disasters were exacerbated by unreasonable management and abuse of natural resources. So both the documents, they provided China with an original and a legal basis for ecological restoration and the governments. So the second period is called the transitional period. And during this period, the Chinese government started to emphasize ecological restoration by uh, approving six major ecological projects as I introduced a moment ago. So those projects, uh, the government invested a lot of money and they cover 53% of China's total national area. And if we have a look at the land use change in China, this map shows the land use and the cover in 2000, and this shows the land use and the cover in 2005, and this is for the 2010. So if we, we compare the, the different land, land use and the cover area, we will found that in China, the forest area increased very sharply, and the urban area also increased. And if we look at the ecosystem services, uh, uh, this, this was uh, from the uh, paper published in, in Science in 2016. And uh, the authors, they calculated 
different ecosystem services uh, and also shows the spatial uh, differences among China. So if we have a look at the ecosystem services in China, we will found that overall between 2000 and 2010, a lot of ecosystem services, they increased, particularly for the food production, carbon sequestration, soil retention, uh, sandstorm prevention and water retention, and also for the flood mitigation, all the ecosystem services increased. So here we show the change, uh, 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 the change in the ecosystem services. So if the value is higher than zero, that means the ecosystem services increased. So for all those kind of ecosystem services, the values increased. But only for the ecosystem services from habitat provision, the value is, the change is negative. So that means this kind of land cover change does not help to increase the ecosystem services for habitat provision. So we still have a big space to improve our ecosystem services for biodiversity. And this is the transitional period. And let's have a look uh, what happened during this transitional period from 2000 to 2012. So I showed the, the dry up of the Yellow River. I still remember in 1997, uh, 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 more than uh, 220 days the Yellow River cannot reach the sea, but we can found a sharp increase in river runoff after the year 2000. So in fact, after 2000, the Yellow River ran dry for zero days. So that means after the year 2000, uh, the Yellow River can always reach the sea. So this is a very big success. And after 2012, we came to the third phase. We call it the ecological priorities period. And in the year 2012, China included the goal of achieving an ecological civilization in its constitution. And this, this was a very big change uh, in the uh, in the society. So in the same year, the government incorporated eco-civilization into the five in one blueprint. Five in one blueprint means innovative, coordinated, green, open, and shared development. So green development became a very important component for Chinese government. And then the report to the 18th National Congress in, in the same year 2012 explicitly emphasized the need to launch major projects for restoring the ecosystems. So in the year 2012, uh, China emphasized a lot on ecological civilization and also the ecological restoration. And also the, 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 the government emphasized a lot uh, for, for the ecological restoration, ecological civilization, and uh, also mentioned is, uh, explicitly that to build a beautiful China is a key to realizing Chinese dream. So for Chinese dream, one very important com component is the uh, beautiful China. Uh, so to reach this, we need the ecological restoration. And also the Chinese government uh, leaders also uh, give speech to the government leaders and uh, mentioned, we should no longer evaluate the performance of the leaders only based on the GDP growth. So in the future, when we assess the performance of the leaders, we also need to think about the environmental protection. We need to think about the ecological restoration. So the environmental indicators were included in the evaluation of the government leaders uh, after 2013. 
So this is a big change in Chinese uh, assessment system. And between 2012 and 2017, uh, China de designated more than 100 national pilot sites for ecological civilization. So for the ecological civilization, ecological restoration is a very important component. And in 2006, the uh, 13th five-year national plan emphasized the ecological restoration and the protection in the typical vulnerable ecological regions. And in the same year, promoting ecological protection and the restoration of mountains, rivers, forests, farmland, and lakes uh, became a very important priority. And uh, the next year, in 2017, the, the 19th National Congress uh, mentioned that China should double efforts on ecological conservation and restoration. And this year, planning of protecting and ecological restoration programs were approved by the Chinese government. And this program will last from 2021 to 2035. So we expect there will be a huge amount of investment in China for ecological restoration in the very near future. So if we look at the publications uh, for ecological restoration, we can also find a sharp increase. So here in this graph is from our team, and the red curve show, shows the uh, number of publications each year. And the green bars show the publications in the US. So this is the publication for China. This is the publication for the US. So we can find there are uh, increasing trend after the year 2000 for ecological restoration uh, in China. And now uh, the total, the annual publication number is close to that in the US. And also in China, we have the, the publications published in Chinese. We can also found a sharp increase in the uh, Chinese publications on ecological restoration. And not only for the journal articles, if we also check the media, the newspaper, we also found the increasing trend of reports on ecological restoration in China. So ecological restoration became a, a, a very important priority for China's society. So I continue to talk about the uh, different, different restoration programs. So the first one is the Three North Shelter uh, program. The objective is to improve the environmental conditions and foster the production of multiple forest products in the Three North region. Here, the Three North region means the Northeast, the northern part, and also the northwest, northwestern part of China. So this program was initiated in 1978. So this was one of the oldest restoration program in China, and it, it lasted for a long time. It will continue to, uh, to, to, uh, to be developed till 2050. And this program covers the northern part of China and covers 13 provinces in China. And there, there are four major restoration strategies. One type is the artificial afforestation. That means to plant trees. The second one is the fruit tree plantations. So to plant the fruit trees. And the third one is the, the third one is the aerial seeding of tree spices, like this. And the last one is the natural vegetation recovery. So if we have a look at the, the effects of the Three North Shelter Forest Program, and here the, the upper graph show the vegetation coverage in 1981. 
and then the middle one shows the vegetation coverage in 2013. So we can also calculate the difference between the vegetation coverage between uh, 2013 and uh, 1981. So we can found that we increase a lot of vegetation coverage in the middle part, in the central part in this area. And the increase in the vegetation coverage is the highest for the central part and it's the lowest for the northwestern part. One reason may be because the northwestern part of China uh, is very dry. So when we plant trees, it's difficult for the trees to live in this area because of the low rainfall. And for this area, the rainfall can be lower than 50 millimeter each year. So very little rainfall. So a lot of trees cannot live without sufficient irrigation. So that may be the reason why for this region, the vegetation coverage increase is not as much as in the middle part and uh, also in uh, uh, less than the northeastern part. So we can also calculate the, the, the net benefit. And for the restoration program, we have total benefit, but we also need to invest. We have the total cost. So the difference be between the total benefits and the total cost we call that the net benefits. So we can also check the net benefit for the different strategies. Like for the artificial afforestation, so in those graphs, if the net benefits are positive, then we use the, the blue colors. So if the net benefits are negative, we show with the red colors. So we found that for the, for the artificial afforestation, only a small provinces, they can benefit from the restoration pro program in terms, of, uh, in terms of net benefit. But for, for many regions, the net benefit is negative. But if we have a look at the fruit tree plantation, we found in all the provinces, the net benefits are positive. So that means if we plant fruit trees, the, the farmers, they can always uh, benefit. They can earn more money because the net benefits are positive. And for the area seeding, most provinces are positive in net benefit, only except one province. And for the natural recovery, all the provinces, they have the positive net benefits. So if we compare different restoration strategies, uh, in terms of net benefits, to plant fruit trees is better than uh, the vegetation recovery, uh, better than the area seeding, and better than the artificial afforestation in terms of net benefits. And the second very important program is called the, uh, called the Natural Forest uh, Protection Program. So the main objective is biodiversity conservation and soil erosion control and also for the forest regeneration. So for this program, uh, we can also assess the net benefit. And we found that uh, for this program, first, this program covers more provinces in China. So we can found a lot of provinces in China. Uh, the, uh, implemented this natural forest protection program. And also in, all, uh, in a large part of China, uh, the net benefit uh, are positive. So I'm sorry, in these in this graphs, the positive values are shown in, in, uh, in red. So most of the provinces benefit from the uh, natural forest protection program. And also the theme the, to plant fruit trees is better than the vegetation recovery, uh, better than the aerial seeding uh, in terms of net benefit. So the, the third very important program is the Green for Green program. 
Uh, then the main objective is to increase forest coverage and to reduce the soil erosion on the sloped crop land. And this program was initiated in 2000, in the year 2000, and it covers uh, 25 provinces. In, in China, in the mainland China, we have 31 provinces in total. So this program covers 25 provinces. And the Green for Green project is the world's largest ecological restoration program in terms of skill and investment. So the total area for this restoration project is about 2 million square kilometer. And the total investment was about uh, 94, uh, 74 billion US dollars. So it's a very big restoration program. And we can also see the big change, the big landscape change. Uh, this is for the Los, uh, Los Plateau. This is before the restoration and this is after the restoration. So we can, we can find for the whole mountain, there is a very big change. Now there are a lot of trees in the mountain, a lot of greenies in the, in the mountain area. So for this green for green project, we can also uh, found that the ecosystem services have been improved significantly for different ecosystem services. So in those maps, if the colors are in green, that means ecosystem services improved. If the colors are in red, that means the ecosystem services uh, uh, were not as high as before. So for, for a large area of China, for the, for the water regulation services, a large area of China, ecosystem services increased. But for the soil conservation, uh, only a few regions in this region, the ecosystem services increased. But in the northern part, the increase is not very significant. And for the sandstorm prevention, mainly in the northern part, the benefit uh, from the restoration program, but not for other regions. And the, the fourth uh, restoration program is called to retaining uh, the grazing land to grassland project because grassland is the largest green ecological area in China, covering a total area of 400 million hectares. And for this restoration program, the main objective is to reduce the impact of overgrazing and promote grassland productivity. And the program was initiated in 2003, uh, mainly in the northern and the southwestern part of China. And if we compare the, the land use uh, between 2000 and 2013, we can found that uh, for, for this program, this program increased the, the normalized difference vegetation uh, index uh, significantly in most part of the area. But still in some other regions, the NDVI decreased uh, between 2000 and 2013. So this means different regions, they benefit differently from the restoration program. So the fifth one is the Beijing Tianjin sound stores uh, uh, for the, for the, uh, the, the sound stores control project. That is to reduce uh, the sound stores uh, to construct the ecological protection system to reduce dust hazard. Uh, this is the, the very big problem in the northern part of China. So this restoration program was initiated in 2000 uh, by afforestation, reforestation, and some other measures. So the recent restoration program is called the a national park system. The objective is to restore large natural ecosystems and to combine ecological protection and sustainable development. So this program was initiated very recently in 2017. The, uh, we have approved 10 
pilot projects for the national park system covering di uh, different provinces in China. So the, the, main, the main idea is like this. The government try to involve different stakeholders, try to involve the scientists, the management community, the policy community, NGOs, the, na uh, the national parks managers, and other beneficiaries to develop a common understanding of the national parks issues. And then uh, with the knowledge gained, uh, the pilot region will implement the national park system to develop the national parks. And with the pilot project, we will learn license, uh, we will get a lot of experience. So we, we will feedback to the, knowledge, uh, to the knowledge. And then in the future, there will be more and more pilot projects for the national park development. So now I would like to move to the effects of the ecological restoration. And first, I want to show the greening of all over the world. And this is the, uh, the leaf, uh, leaf area index between the change of leaf area index between 2000 and 2017. So if the colors are in green, that means the leaf area index increased. So we, we found that in many regions, uh, Leaf area index increase, like in China, in India, there are seven, uh, seven major regions with increasing leaf area index. And the greening is uh, prom uh, prominently clustered in seven regions across different continents, particularly for China, because China contributed to 25% of the observed total net increase in the green leaf area globally. So this paper was published last year, and after this paper was published, a lot of media reported this result because they, uh, they think that China, China leads the V in greening for all over the world because of the restoration program. And also, uh, scientists also analyzed the, the effects on biodiversity after the restoration program. So here I will not go to the details of this graph, but I want to show the result to you. And one result is if we compare the biodiversity for the restored ecosystem and for the ecosystem before the restoration or the degraded uh, ecosystem. So the results show that the restoration can always, almost always enhanced by diversity in degraded ecosystems. But if we compare the restored ecosystem with the native ecosystem of the reference ecosystem, we also found that the restoration program cannot reach the biodiversity level at the natural level. So that means for most of the restoration program, they cannot reach the same biodiversity level as the native ecosystems. And certainly the impact of restoration on biodiversity also depends on the restoration in different climate zones, in different locations. But more or less, the results show if we restore our ecosystems, we can help to increase the biodiversity for different regions in China. And I mentioned the Lost Plateau a moment ago. This is a very important region because, because this region has the highest erosion rates in the world. And also before, the poverty problem is a very big issue for this region. So this is the location of the Lost Plateau. So the, the Chinese people spend a lot of money to restore the ecosystem for the Lost Plateau. And then you can see the big change for the Lost Plateau. This picture 
was taken in 1995 and this was taken in 2009. So you can see the, the same mountain here, but with different landscape, there are almost no any green trees here, but in 2009, there are a lot of greenies. And also the sharp change uh, for the same place in this, loca this, this location between 1995 and 2009. So those two photos show the big difference for the entire mountain area of the Los Plateau. So this picture was taken uh, in 1984, and then the lower one was taken in 2012. So you can see the really the big change for the entire Los Plateau area after restoration. And if we compare the, the different, uh, the area of different land uses, uh, we, we also found that for the Los Plateau region, the woodland area and the grassland area increased, but the farmland area decreased because there were a lot of con uh, conversion from farmland to woodland and grassland. And also the main purpose of this, uh, this restoration program is to control the soil erosion. So this, this graph show the effects of the restoration program. If the color is green, that means the soil erosion was reduced. So we can see for the entire uh, Los Plateau region, the soil erosion was reduced significantly. So that means the restoration, uh, the restoration program is quite successful for the soil erosion issues in the Los Plateau region. So another project I was involved in is the restoration of a river called the Yunding River. That is the mother river of Beijing. Beijing is the capital city of China. So for this Yunding River, it used to be a river with a lot of flood problem with too much water in the 19th century, but in recent years, because of, the, the, uh, because of the growth of population, people are using more and more water in this area, in this river basin. And, and this leads to the decline of the river discharge. So we can see the sharp decrease in river runoff for the, for the Yunding River. And I also took a picture in the early 2000s. So this is the downstream of the Yellow River. And when we visited this part, we found there is no any water in the river, band, uh, river bed uh, because of the overuse of, of water in this river basin. So the Mother River uh, of Beijing, the Yunding River has changed a lot from a flooding river to a river that runs dry uh, in, uh, in 2000. So to restore this river, we have to bring water. And then I show a few pictures. So this is the, this is the picture before the restoration, and this is the picture after the restoration. So the, the water is brought to the river. And this is the, the river before restoration, and this is the river after the restoration. So the landscape is also different. So I also want to discuss a few issues and challenges for the ecological restoration program in China. The first issue is about the potential problems with the traditional solutions, particularly for the afforestation, because uh, the afforestation, particularly in the northern part of China, like the in the northwestern part of China, uh, precipitation is very low. So when we plant trees, the trees cannot live because there is no sufficient water. So that could be a very big reason, uh, a very big problem, uh, because, because we, uh, when we plant trees, the trees cannot grow up, and many trees died because, uh, because of the lack of water. So this is a potential problem for the restore pro, uh, restoration program in the northern part of China. Uh, the second one is about the governance. 
So previously, a lot of restore, uh, restoration program mainly focused on the short-term success rather than the long-term because the local uh, government, they want, they want to show uh, the restoration effects in a short time. Uh, so maybe they do not think too much about the long-term effects. And also there are many departments in China involved in the restoration program. So there are misleading instructions from different departments from the national level to the country level. But the good thing is in the year 2018, we established a new ministry called the Ministry of Natural Resources and there is a shift towards the long-term success of restoration program coordinated by this ministry with a systematic approach. So now this ministry is playing a very important role for the restoration program by coordinating different regions, different programs uh, in a systematic way, and also by thinking about the long-term restoration effects. So the third issue is about the, the benefits to the local people, because we should not only think about the ecological effects, we also need to think about the social and economic benefits. So that means the local stakeholders, they have to benefit from the restoration program. So uh, for, for this, this could be a big issue because, uh, because before, the government subsidized the restoration program a lot by investing a lot of money. I, I mentioned about 97% of the investment is from the government. But in the future, we need to use the market to promote the restoration program. In that way, we need to think about the social benefits, the economic benefits. Uh, uh, so that could be a very important issue for the uh, success of the ecological restoration program in China. The fourth one is about the monitoring problem. That is not only for China, but also for many, many countries. And I, I found that for many ecological restoration projects, they were seldomly monitored. So without the monitoring, it's difficult to understand the structure and the function of the ecosystem. And also it's difficult to understand the effects of the restoration program. So now in China, I always tell uh, the government and also uh, different people that when we design the restoration program, we have to keep the monitoring in mind. We have to start the monitoring program from the starting point of the restoration program. Uh, to the end, and even after the restoration program, we still need to monitor the ecosystem to see the long-term effects of the restoration program. So I think monitoring is very important for restoration program. And luckily, the Chinese Academy of Sciences has established a very big network for the uh, ecosystem, uh, ecosystem monitoring. But I think in the future, we need more efforts for, for monitoring the restoration programs. So the fifth issue is about the lack of reference model in ecological restoration. As I introduced, uh, now the government will invest more and more money for the restoration project. But when the people, they work on the restoration program, they may not think about the reference model they do not have a very clear idea about uh, 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 the reference ecosystems. So I, I also talk to the people now, uh, we need to uh, first select the reference model before we work on the restoration program. And then we need to check after the restoration program, whether we have reached our target of restoration. So the selection of a reference model is very important for the restoration. So now I would like to give some concluding remarks. At the beginning, I talk about China's three development period 
from the economic priorities period to the transitional, transitional period to the ecological priorities period. I then I mentioned the ecological restoration and eco-civilization. So many people want to ask the question, can we achieve our target of ecological restoration and eco-civilization? So I want to answer this question by using one example that is called the Fei Han Ba. Fei Han Ba is, uh, uh, covers almost 100,000 hectares uh, at the border area of the uh, southern edge of the Inner, Inner Mongolia. So for the Fei Han Ba, this is the picture for Fei Han Ba uh, in 1860s. So it used to be a very lovely region and uh, the Fei Han Ba was the hunting field for imperial household. So the, the king and the queen, they often came to this region for hunting uh, in the 19th century. But many people came here for land claim, uh, reclaiming uh, in 1863. So after a century of land reclaiming, so this is the, this is the Fei Han Ba in 1960s. So this region became a very harsh region and it's difficult to live here because uh, the landscape, the, the, there, there, there were a lot of dust and uh, uh, there are almost no forests and grassland. So the condition was very bad in 1960s. So starting from the 1960s, the first generation of the, the, the people came here to plant trees. And then after uh, 50 years, so this is the Sehan Ba now. So after three generations of those, uh, these uh, foresters, they have increased the forest coverage from 11% in the 1960s to the 80% now. So you can see the pictures now, uh, the, the pictures for Sahan Ba. And uh, there are big differences between 1960s and now. So this Sahan Ba, the, 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 the people, the, the vine, the United Nations highest environmental owner called the champions of the Earth Award for transforming degraded land into a lush paradise. So the three generations of people were invited to the ceremony of this award, uh, award uh, receiving ceremony, uh, ceremony. So during this event, the first generation uh, person, uh, Liu Haiying, she gave a speech at this ceremony. She mentioned, I believe that as long as we continue to promote ecological civilization, Generation after generation, China can create more green miracles like Se Han Ba and achieve harmony between humans and nature. So I think with our uh, efforts together, we can achieve the target of ecological restoration and the target of ecological civilization. So uh, in the past few years, I also published a few uh, books on uh, ecological restoration. Uh, this is a book in Chinese and in English, and it will be translated in several other languages in the near future. And also together with a lot of international uh, scientists and uh, practitioners, we worked on the international standard for ecological restoration. And uh, this standard, standard was released uh, last year in both English and Chinese language. So if you are interested, you can check the standard called the International Principles and the Standards for the Practice of Ecological Restoration. So I want to uh, finalize my talk with this picture. So last year I visited Xuzhou, it's a city in China, and uh, I visited their restoration program. I found this stone. And on the stone, there were quite a lot of characters the English meaning is 
we can turn green mountains and clean water into gold and silver mountains only after we restore them. So that means the ecological restoration is very important. Only with the restoration program, we can change uh, the, the mountains and the water into our natural capital. So I hope in the future we can, we can collaborate more in the future and uh, let's, let's work together to protect our nature and to save our world uh, with the ecological restoration program. So that's all for my presentation. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Liu. We have had a very active series of questions posted in the question and answer. And also some folks have posted their questions directly into the chat. There are way more questions than we will be able to address in the time that we have, but I've organized them into some themes. Um, but first, congratulations on such a thorough and interesting presentation. It is amazing to learn how much restoration efforts have increased in China in recent years and the fact that there has been so much political, scientific, and focus in the popular media. Um, there were a couple questions about methods and I think I'll ask you those first. And then there was some about conservation value of restoration activities and trade-offs. Um, and the next category I'll ask you are about um, effects on local people and political decision-making. And so for those of you who need to drop off uh, earlier or right now, we will be posting the video and you can see the full set of question and answers then. So um, the first question was about how the net benefits were calculated from the projects in which you showed um, increases or decreases in net benefits. So thank you, Kara. Uh, for the net benefit, uh, mainly we, uh, well, it's not from my research, but from, uh, from the Chinese colleagues. So yes. they calculate the net benefit by considering uh, the total costs and also the total benefits. The total costs, uh, including uh, include the, uh, the cost to to buy the trees and uh, also for the seeds, for the fertilizer, and probably also for irrigation. So different types of uh, costs uh, for for the uh, like the afforestation program or other type of restoration program, and the benefit benefit uh, like for the fruits. For the fruits, it's quite easy because the local farmers, they always sell the fruits in the market. So, so uh, the calculation is based on the price and the, the total production. But for the, for the, forest, uh, for, for, for the trees, for the trees, uh, uh, mainly there are different types of trees. One type is the artificial, artificial uh, trees. So the, the farmers, they may sell woods, but also they, they, they use the, the trees as a kind of ecosystem services for climate regulation or water regulation. So this kind of different benefits. So the authors, they calculate the total benefits from the restoration program and also the total cost. And then the difference between the total benefits and the total cost is the, the net benefits. So the results I show is the net benefits. Great, thank you. Really interesting publication. There is quite a few questions about specific restoration activities. Um, one, which is a little bit narrow, but I think may be interesting to our participants from all different parts of the world is about aerial seeding. And if you could comment on, um, the why aerial seeding is being done? Uh, well, I don't know. How, okay. 
So I mentioned four types of uh, restoration programs. Uh, let me see. Yeah. So those are the, the four types of strategies for the restoration program. And the aerial seeding is uh, like in this picture because in a lot of mountain or very harsh, uh, harsh condition area, and uh, it's difficult for the people to plant trees in those area. So they use air plan to, uh, here is the air plan, and then the air plan will, will, uh, will thin the, the feedings to the area, and then uh, the trees can, can, can grow, can grow in those kind of area. So this is the aerial seeding of the tree species. So it's not, it's, it's not grow, uh, uh, we do not need the people to grow the trees, but we use this kind of high technology to plant trees. Great, thank you. There were a lot of questions about um, the types of species that are planted and interest in knowing whether in recent years there's been more of a focus on planting native species and more uh, <coughs> diverse plantings than in previous years. Okay, yeah, that is a very good question. Uh, in fact, at the initial, uh, at the initial stage, uh, uh, when we work on the restoration, we did not pay too much about the biodiversity and not too much about the native species. But this triggered a lot of problems. Like two years ago, I, I went to a restoration program area. I found that area is for the panda uh, because they want to plant more trees so that they think the panda will like the trees but the trees are not native. They, they are the invasive uh, species. So after the restoration program, the panda will not uh, walk in the forest because they do not like the uh, invasive species. So, but, but the good thing is in recent years, uh, the government tried to promote the uh, biodiversity in the restoration program and there are specific regulation for the biodiversity issues for the restoration program. So I think uh, uh, previously there was not so many, uh, there was not much attention paid to the uh, native species, but, but now uh, it's a big, a very important priority for restoration program. Yeah. Great, that's great to hear. There were several questions um, kind of related to that about why forests are being planted above tree line on the Tibetan plateau, thus destroying, you know, potentially important grassland and wetland habitat, and about um, the fact that tree plantations typically have low biodiversity, so whether that's an improvement. And, you know, we, there are, are a lot of concerns globally about forest landscape restoration in that arena, you know, trade-offs between biodiversity. Rather than answering any of these specific questions, I'm wondering if you have any comments about forest landscape restoration and biodiversity protection and how we can um, do better in that arena improving strong biodiversity outcomes within forest landscape restoration? Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I think uh, one question is about the, the uh, forestation in the Tibetan Plateau and also the northern part of China, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so be because uh, initially uh, like the green for green program is designed to convert the cropland into the forest. forest. So uh, because of the policy, a lot of regions, they just convert the, uh, the cropland into forest and not to the grassland. But after uh, a few years of practice, they found that in some regions, it's not a good strategy to plant trees. And in fact, for, for a lot of regions, 
we are very good at for the grass line, uh, for the grass growth. So the policy was changed a little bit. So before it's called the conversion from cropland to forest, but later on the, the, they changed the policy to uh, conversion of uh, cropland to forest and grassland. So now uh, the government tried to persuade the people to think about the local condition. If, if it's more suitable for grassland, it's better to convert to the grassland. So mm -hmm. there is a kind of policy change during the implementation of the policies. Great, thank you for clarifying that. So let's change topics to sure. the human side. There were several questions about um, conflicts between land use activities. So here's the first question. How do you address and resolve contradicting land use activities to protect investments achieved over the years? For instance, in areas where you've planted trees, landowners or land users may later decide to do other activities. And then I'll just add a couple other questions because you may want to comment on them together. In the process of restoration, do you involve the population? And do you have any problems with how the land management or stakeholders ideas of using the property. And then there was a question about impacts on local and indigenous populations. Okay. So conflicting land uses, whether people are involved in the process and effects on local and indigenous people. Sure. I, uh, as I mentioned, uh, to, to think about the economic benefit is very important, particularly when the local stakeholders are involved in the restoration program. And uh, before, uh, the government gave a lot of subsidy to the, to the local people, particularly for the farmers. So in that way, the farmers would like to convert the cropland into uh, different natural ecosystems including forests and the grassland. So the subsidies play a very important role uh, for this kind of uh, social, uh, social issues. So you also mentioned uh, uh, whether after the con conversion, whether the, the, the people, they, they have other activities. In fact, it's, it's, it's not so much because now uh, in China, the farmers, many, most of the farmers, they do not really want to work uh, in the farm area. And a lot of, particularly for the young farmers, they want to go to the cities to work. So you can, you can see a very interesting phenomenon in China. If you go to the rural area in the villages, you often find old people, uh, children, and sometimes you find women, but it's difficult to find young men because a lot of young men, they go to the cities to work. So uh, because the benefit from the, from the cropland activities are very low. So uh, this means even after the conversion to the natural ecosystems, the farmers will not want to convert back and they, want, they do not want to have other activities. So I think that may be a very important reason uh, why uh, in some rural areas the restoration program is successful. So some... Involving local people? Uh, invo process. involving the local, involving the local people. So this, this is a very important issue. And uh, particularly in recent years, I, I introduced uh, the very recent restoration program like the national park system. And mm. the, the, main, uh, the main purpose is to involve the, the different stakeholders, uh, not only the local people, but also the managers, the NGOs, government officers, and also scientists in the design of the restoration program. So I, I think uh, uh, the good thing is the Chinese government want to learn from the international lessons 
because the stakeholder involvement is a very big issue in many European countries and also in US, in Australia. So in recent years, the government lent a lot uh, to involve the stakeholders. So I'm very happy to see that for the uh, national park system, uh, we try to involve different people uh, in the design of the uh, national park issues. So this is a very big direction for the future restoration program. Interesting. And are there issues with overlapping restoration initiatives on the same lands? Overlapping? Any yes, yes. That, uh, uh, that was a problem before because I was involved in a project on China's ecosystem services assessment a few years ago, and we tried to uh, find out the, the land area change. But then we uh, finally we found that when we, when we check the restoration program, if, if we put different maps together, like the grassland map and also uh, the forest, uh, forest land map and the farmland map, we found the, the thumb of the total land area is bigger than the real area. So that mm -hmm. means there must be some overlapping of the, uh, of the, uh, of the uh, restoration program. Uh, the reason is because uh, there are different, apart, uh, different departments to implement the restoration program. Uh, like when, when, the, when the people work on the river uh, restoration, they do not think about the, the, the grassland restoration. When the people working on the uh, grassland restoration, they do not think about the forestry. So this, mm. kind, of, uh, this kind of different interests uh, means that uh, we need a more systematic view to, uh, for the restoration program. So the good trend is, uh, I mentioned the establishment of the Ministry of, of uh, Natural Resources. And for these resources, the main purpose is to coordinate everything. So the, the tri they mentioned we need to put everything in one map. So mm -hmm. that means for all the activities, we need to coordinate them in a systematic way. And in the future, when we work on the program, uh, when we add up all the, uh, all the different types of program, we are still in the same map. So that is the rule of the, the Ministry of Natural Resources. That is very interesting, yeah. Okay, well, we are clearly out of time. I wanna thank you so much for giving your presentation, especially in the middle of the night in China. And, um, providing all of the amazing resources within your talk to key papers for people to follow up on. I did post the link in the chat to the standards, the international principles and standards, which you mentioned. So people have that. And many people um, have asked even just in the last few minutes about the presentation. And so I'll just say again, that it will be posted on our YouTube channel, which you can subscribe to, and on the IUCN CEM webpage. Um, next month, I hope many of you can join us for Irene Zagger's presentation on the Red List of Ecosystems. Again, that'll be the third Friday of August. So thank you for the presentation. I think all of us are probably now really interested in digging in more to the excellent examples um, that have been going on in China. Thank you. Thank you, Carla. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for your patience in the talk. <laughs>